much she's going to come and achieve this at all. But I have a few more little facts and things about her. <laughs> uh, so, she has three Emmys, seven tattoos, and da, 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 was head of her school cheerleading <laughs> group. where they say, give me two real things and one fiction and we'll try and guess. And um, that was real and nobody ever guessed if it was in this fiction. Okay, I'm gonna maybe periodically swoop down because I don't want to drop my coffee. Okay, so this, as Steve um, mentioned in his talk yesterday, is the first time that I am also giving this talk. You are my test audience and um, hopefully it goes over well. If somebody can keep me honest on time, that would be great too, because I think that the more fun part of the talk is the Q&A and the, the interactive part, so I don't want to like drag on for too long. Um, this will all make sense hopefully soon. We'll see, we'll get there. Um, but I want to start with uh, uh, introducing myself. For those of you who might not know me, I was actually at the New Zealand Skeptics Conference two years ago, so I had the wonderful opportunity to visit the South Island as part of that trip um, with my boyfriend at the time. And we spent quite a lot of time in um, Glenorchy, that's where we stayed, and absolutely loved it, it was beautiful. Um, I wasn't able to come early with the guys this time because I have so much school work, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but I was here when we had the conference, I think it was in Wellington, right? And that was a ton of fun. I got to meet some of you then, um, and so hopefully this won't be too redundant. But I wanted to give you a little bit of my background. As Susie mentioned before, I was born and raised Mormon in a very southern part of the United States. I grew up in Texas in the Bible Belt and um, had a lot of pressures. And so, kind of, this is like a brief schematic of my journey. Uh, I grew up Mormon. I was really specialized and focused on my, my uh, jazz singing at the time. When I was young, this was a source of passion for me. It was actually my potential would be career. It's what I went to college to study. I was in a competitive jazz group all through high school and early college. Ultimately, I found that taking a lot of music theory made uh, singing less fun, and I went into uh, psychology. So my undergraduate degree was in psychology, and uh, my minor was philosophy. Then I decided to stay and get a master's degree in neuroscience. So I was working as a neuroscientist and an adjunct professor for some time, um, uh, working as the uh, chief cell culture technician in my lab. I did my master's thesis on uh, techniques for doing electrophysiology within mass tissue in the brain. And I, I did that for, for a while, and I was always had the ambition to go back and finish or to go back and start a PhD. Um, but life kind of gets in the way, and I found myself in a position where I was able to work as a science communicator. And so that's what I've actually been doing for the past decade. I, I've been basically, when people ask, what do you do for a living? That's what I say, I'm a science communicator. And then they say, what the hell is that? And I have to explain more. Uh, but so I split my time between doing television work, that's where most of, um, that's kind of my core job, that's where it all started. So currently I work on a show called Brain Games. I'm not sure if you guys know about this show. It was on for several years in the US on National Geographic Channel. And then, um, they decided to retool it and reboot it. So it's not out yet, but it comes out, I think, January 20th, all over the world. And it's uh, hosted by Keegan Michael Key, which uh, I don't know if you guys ever got Key and Peel. Did you ever get that sketch comedy show? No, he's very funny. Um, and it's, it's a really fun kind of like game show where I do a lot of field work on it. Um, and, you know, I've done a lot of other shows for National Geographic and, and other science outlets over the years. But I also obviously work on Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Prior to joining them, I had started my own podcast, Talk Nerdy, and I've been doing that now for, I think, six, six years. Um, I give talks. I sometimes write. I don't really like writing, so I don't do it as much. But this is kind of, I stitch that together to be my, my main career. That's why I support myself. And only recently did I decide that it was time to go back to school, because here's the thing. In the US, we don't have like national anything. So um, if you get sick, you have to pay for it. Um, health insurance is very expensive, and we have to pay for our education, like all the way through. 
And so it's very, very expensive, and a lot of people are saddled with student loan debt. I decided that I didn't want to go back to school until I didn't have to take out loans. So I worked very hard to make enough money to be able to go back to school and pay for it out of pocket. It's very, very difficult. I'm very tired all the time, but what I'm doing now is working on a, a PhD in clinical psychology. So I'm a third year PhD student, which means I'm in the phase, this is also different for you guys, but I'm in the phase where I'm finishing my coursework, because yes, we have lots of coursework, even at the PhD level, um, moving into my dissertation, and at the same time, getting all of my clinical hours, so I'm seeing patients a lot. So the point of the talk today is to kind of talk to you a little bit about my evolution as a skeptic, and what are some of the things that I've learned going through these motions, but specifically and especially in my work in existential psychotherapy, and the kinds of world that that's opened up to me, uh, up for me a little bit as a science communicator, but also as a therapist and as a skeptic, because I think there's a lot of crossover in these different kind of hats that I wear. Um, I think we can talk about this later, if it's something that interests you, because most people don't know what that is. Um, we, can, we can discuss it when we, um, when we do the Q&A, if you guys are interested in it. But instead of spending a lot of time on that, I basically want to jump into some of the views that people have about psychology. So, you know, kind of again, speaking to, did every, who, who went to Steve's talk yesterday? Most everybody, right? So I don't know if you remember, but there was a portion during the talk where he was like, and then in psychology, the evidence is squishy. And, and that's complicated and we'll kind of skip over it. And it's true, that the evidence can be very squishy and it is very complicated. And so that's sort of what I wanted to focus on a little bit. How do we do psychology? Is psychology a science? And especially clinical psychology, the therapy side of psychology, it can be a little bit squishy. It's not squishy though because it's bad science, it's squishy because the rules don't always apply when we're talking about psychotherapy, we're talking about human subjects. So, I don't know if you guys have read Alice in Wonderland, but there is a, a um, scene, that's not what it's called in a book, um, there's a portion in the book that um, where there's a dodo bird and they all get wet, they're swimming and they all get wet and they decide that they want to dry off and have a competition about who gets dry first. So they run around the pond and everybody by the end of it becomes so tired that they can't remember who ran the farthest. And then the dodo bird says, everybody has won and almost get prizes. And this quote was pulled by a psychologist in 1936 named Saul Rosenzweig, and he actually proposed what has now become known as the dodo bird conjecture in psychology, in clinical psychology. And what the dodo bird conjecture says is that for some reason, it doesn't, and Steve mentioned this before, it doesn't seem to matter whether a therapist is oriented psychodynamically, psychoanalytically. A lot of people aren't really pure psycho, um, psychoanalysts anymore, that's sort of gone by the wayside, but there's a more modern version of that kind of Freudian view in psychology, and they call it psychodynamic psychotherapy. Whether they are cognitive behavioral therapists, which is maybe something that most people have heard a little more of, and maybe they identify with being more evidence-based. Whether you're existential, whether you're third wave, you're a feminist psychologist, um, a multicultural psychologist, whatever you call yourself, kind of doesn't seem to matter what your approach is, but instead, there are these things called common factors. And the common factors actually seem to account for most of the positive variance in psychology outcomes. So Steve mentioned before um, how good the therapist is, which I think is kind of a shorthand for a handful of traits that seem to actually be most predictive of positive outcomes from therapy. So unconditional positive regard, empathy, a non-judgmental stance, therapist, patient uh, relationships. When these things are good, or when they're observed to be in the positive direction, we tend to see better outcomes from therapy. Now, whether you're doing a workbook, or whether you're doing long-term therapy to talk about trauma, there are a lot of different variables in there. Now, I don't want to wash the whole thing away and say that the approach doesn't matter at all because there are evidence-based treatments that are accepted by a lot of psychology um, groups like the American Psychological Association, which is the organization that I am a member of and they do the accreditation in the U.S. Um, 
But basically, it seems to pan out in the literature if and only if the treatments are bona fide therapies. So that's the important, I think, caveat. They have to be bona fide therapies. So things like, uh, like pseudoscientific approaches, like conversion therapy, for example, not only does it not work, but it causes harm, but that's also not a bona fide psychotherapy. So when you look at bona fide psychotherapies, it doesn't really seem to matter what the approach is, so long as these traits and features are present. But that's not always the case, because there are certain types of situations in which specific treatments do seem to work better than others. And this is where you start to see the literature get really thick around cognitive behavioral intervention. So certain types of anxiety disorders are going to respond very well to very like manualized treatments, or certain types of trauma, for example, might respond well. The question there, and this is where things get a little bit nuanced, and that's where I'm kind of asking you guys throughout this talk to sort of exist in the gray area with me and start asking some more fundamental questions about the fuzzy stuff that's not quite as obvious, is, is the reason that the literature bears out in those areas because those areas lend themselves to doing research more easily? Also, is the reason that the literature bears out positively in those areas because those are very simple, I shouldn't say simple, but um, individual, non-comorbid, meaning they exist on their own, they're not like mixed up with a bunch of other symptoms, are we specifically treating the symptoms? So if somebody comes in and they say, I have an intense fear of flying, I really need to work on my intense fear of flying, a therapist might say, we're gonna work on that, and they'll have, workbooks and they'll maybe do a VR thing and they'll put them in a place where they and then they'll work up to being able to fly and eventually the exposure therapy works and they're able to fly. But is that symptom connected to something deeper underneath? Is there a more fundamental problem that's not necessarily being looked at? So there are certain types of psychological disorders or symptoms that are simply easier to treat utilizing a medical model than complex trauma or difficult, you know, depressive sy syndromes where we don't really know what the cause is. Those kinds of things can be a lot more difficult to approach. Um, so keep these things in mind. I mean, this is where kind of existential psychotherapy enters into the mix. It's not terribly evidence-based, but for some reason I'm really drawn to it. And so this has started to make me question as a skeptic. Why is it that I'm not doing CBT work? Why do I want to get really deep into existential psychotherapy? And how is this affecting me throughout my lifespan, right? Going from being Mormon first to becoming an atheist. This was my first actual kind of big transition, and I sort of left that out when we were talking before we were talking. I was talking at you before. Um, I found atheism long before I found skepticism. So different people have these different paths. And you hear, I think, a common theme that some people are um, you know, evangelical Christians, or they are you know, fundamentalists, or they have these firm beliefs, and then they start to question other aspects of their life, and they start to, ooh, gosh, but what about my relationship with God? Um, there are people who are very good skeptics who are still religious, and they're able to figure out how to make those things work for them. I sort of approached it through the back door. So I was, uh, you know, I was raised in a fundamentalist religion. I rejected that religion when I was about 15 years old and left the church. And that sort of um, rejection, I think, happened long before I was a political thinker, long before I really had kind of honed critical thinking as an abstract idea. And so I think I was utilizing some of these tools, but I was completely unaware of it. There was no metacognition around critical thinking when I was 15, all I wanted to do was smoke weed. Um, so I think that the skepticism stuff came a lot later, and I didn't really even realize I was a skeptic, per se. I was just a scientist, and I was just an atheist, and I was getting booked to give talks at atheist conferences, and then I sort of found a skeptical group, and I realized, oh, I kind of think the same way these people think, and, and we have the same values. And, um, and that was sort of my journey into skepticism. But what ended up happening as I got older is that I went from being really firebrand in my approach to atheism to becoming a lot more kind of gentle 
And I think that that's starting to happen in my skepticism. And I wanted to bring some of those, I don't even want to call them insights because I don't, I don't have the answers, but I wanted to share with you my process, hoping that maybe that process might mean something to you. So I'm going to flip the script a little bit and I'm going to show you that we're on the same team first. Yes. Okay, so has Stephen Colbert made it across the oceans? Okay. So um, he is unfortunately not as, a, as much of a big deal in the States anymore because when he was doing his late night show on Comedy Central, he had really, really broad appeal. And, and, or I shouldn't say that, it was more niche appeal. And then he actually got a late night position on one of the main television networks, so he's a bit wired down now. And he no longer does the character, which is so sad because we all love the character. So if you don't know Stephen Colbert, he did a character for a long time of like a very, very staunch right-wing conservative figure uh, who was almost like a parody of, of the, pol the, the super right-wing politicians in uh, the United States. And um, he never broke his character. And it was a great vehicle for actually um, delivering, I think, a little bit more progressive views. But he actually did coin this term, truthiness, and now we hear it, it's kind of reverberated around the world. And this idea is not a new idea, but truthiness, as he put it, was truth that comes from the gut, not books. And I think in a lot of ways, and these are the things that we as skeptical activists are fighting against, right? These truthiness ideas that are held very, very dearly, these sacred cows that a lot of people have when it comes to extreme things like conspiracy theories or maybe you know very basic beliefs that they hold on to. And some people, you know, would argue that almost everybody has a sacred cow somewhere deep down inside of them. And um, it's, it's a difficult thing, you know, at the SGU we sometimes will do these private shows and that's a very common question that people ask. It's like, what is the one thing you hold on to? And um, you know, I think the most popular answer on the panel is like, nothing, I've got no problem with it. But. I still wear those face masks at night because I love them, but I know that they do nothing. <laughs> it just feels so good. I feel like I'm pampering myself. Okay. Um, and so then uh, the uh, a kind of more official definition here is that it's a quality of preferring concept or facts one wishes to be true rather than concepts or facts known to be true. So kind of ignoring the evidence. Um, and I think there's a lot baked into this, right? We could spend the hour just talking about the complexity of holding false beliefs. Um, you know, and we'll get to some of these things, but this idea that the will is more important than the no, or this idea, I think, for a lot of people that authority on the whole is a difficult thing to trust, and this really does breed a lot of that conspiratorial thinking. And, you know, to some extent, there's some validity in some of these, like, fears, especially, I think, around the medical establishment, especially in minority populations. Um, in the U.S., which is what I can speak to, there's a long history of abuses within the kind of more colonial medical establishment against Native peoples, against African American peoples. There are the famous Tuskegee syphilis trials. There is a lot of forced um, sterilization, and so there it does become this very complicated picture around what you might call prudent paranoia and conspiratorial thinking. And where is that line? And is that line wiggly, or is it very firm? And it kind of depends on who you ask and it kind of depends on the context. And so I think that's something that's important for us to keep in mind. Okay, so um, this, oh weird, it came up in, I did that at one point, me. You know, you can do that in slides. Um, this is a, a pretty famous quote by a psychologist named David Dunning. Um, you may have heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect. So this was a study originally published in 1999 by David Dunning and his graduate student, Justin Kruger. And this quote, I think, embodies the Dunning-Kruger effect. Well, it's kind of misunderstood. Um, you know, we could bust some myths around the Dunning-Kruger effect if you like, but, but the main um, takeaway is that an ignorant mind is precisely not a spotless empty vessel, but one that's filled with the clutter of irrelevant or misleading life expectations, theories, facts, intuitions, strategies, algorithms, heuristics, metaphors, and hunches that regrettably have the look and feel of useful and accurate knowledge. So the Dunning-Kruger effect, um, basically the study was that individuals were given a test of logic, that's how they started, but now it's been replicated in all sorts of different applications. Individuals were given a logic test, and then not only did they get a score on how well they did on the logic test, but they were given a self-report survey that asked, how well do you think that you did on this logic test? And they found that individuals with the lowest scores tended to think that they did significantly better. So there were these extreme views, 
And the way that Dunning and Kruger <coughs> rationalized why they were seeing this effect over and over again was based on something called metacognition. So they said, you need a certain level of logical reasoning to even know that you don't have a certain level of logical reasoning. And so if you're lacking that metacognition, you're always going to overinflate how well you did. That's really the crux of it. It's not that stupid people think they're smart. That's not the outcome of this study. The outcome of this study is that you have to have a certain level of skill, and this was a logic study. But then they started to do it in other applications, and they realized that almost everybody has a Dunning-Kruger effect about something. Because you have to have a certain level of knowledge to know that you don't have the knowledge, right? So we can almost all find a test that we could take where we would end up with a Dunning-Kruger type score. Um, and the weird thing is, and I always like to, to talk about this even though it's not as relevant to the conversation, the people who have the highest scores actually rated themselves as lower. And a lot of people think that's, oh, because it's a double bound thing or it's a bimodal distribution. It doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to be the case that even the people with the highest scores, it's not that they underestimated how well they did, it's that they overestimated how well other people did. So they assumed that they would have been somewhere in the middle. Because once they were given the tests of the low scoring people to score themselves, they realized how poorly they did and they were able to adjust their self-report surveys of how well these high scoring people did. All right, um, so that's that. That's the Dunning-Kruger effect. This is a very important cognitive bias that a lot of us deal with. It's just we tend to only deal with it in areas where we don't have expertise. This is why it makes it really hard to believe authority figures when they're talking about things that we really don't understand. Some of us are able to just say, okay, this is not my area of expertise. I understand academia. I understand um, the process by which these ex experts develop their expertise, and I'm going to trust that they know because they're looking at the literature and they're actively doing that. But not only does that require, I think, a high level of kind of cognitive flexibility. It also is a privileged position to be in, and I think that's something that we often forget. Being a skeptic, in a way, is being very, very privileged. It's having the basic education to be able to understand these things, right? And it's being in a position within society where we, so basically the definition of privilege in many ways is thinking that everybody else has it too. It's not realizing that somehow you are different than, than some of the other people around you. And so it's being in a position in society where we can say, well, I think like this, why doesn't everybody else think like this? And not ever stopping to try and understand why other people don't think like this. And thinking, hey, those reasons that they don't think like this might be valid. It doesn't mean that they're accurate, it doesn't mean that they're correct, but they might be valid for those people. And that's really an important starting point. Okay, another deep cognitive bias that we deal with is confirmation bias. I don't think I have to spend too much time on this because this is sort of like in the skeptic handbook. It's like the first chapter, right? Uh, so confirmation bias is, did you guys ever see the movie Pi? Yeah, so that's confirmation bias in a nutshell. It's once you expect to see a number, you're gonna see it everywhere, right? It's, it's, it's actually looking after the fact. It's, it's kind of the opposite of how we do science, where we actually develop a hypothesis so that we try to disprove the hypothesis and we set all the parameters before we collect any of the data. It's the only way to do really legitimate science. If we start changing the parameters as we go, we're actually manipulating the science. I mean, some of that is p-hacking, some of that is really unethical. In, but confirmation bias is something that we all do. We have these heuristics, we have these templates, we have these ways that we see the world, and we develop some really good schematics for that. You know, these observational schematics that serve us evolutionarily. They keep us alive, they keep us healthy. Unfortunately, they don't always serve us when we're trying to move into kind of a, a more sophisticated level of cognition. So now all of a sudden the heuristic that seemed like a really good easy template we start to see things that don't fit very well and we put them in categories. And sometimes they don't really fit when we shove them in those categories. We will justify why that's still the case, even if the evidence doesn't really bear out because it's so much harder to completely change your paradigm. I mean, we know this from uh, the structure of scientific revolutions, right? This is Cunian philosophy that it takes scientists sometimes decades to change their own paradigms about things. It takes a lot of disconfirming evidence 
So for us individually to change our minds about really deeply held beliefs, it's not an easy process. And sometimes it takes a lot of disconfirming evidence, and there's an emotional level to it that we have to remember. So this all kind of comes down to this concept, and we talk about it a, a bit in our book, of neuropsychological humility. This is basically this idea that once you really start to understand your own neuropsychology, once you start to really care about metacognition, how does my brain work? Oh, my memory's not a tape recorder, that's not how memory works. I'm rewriting my memory every time I access a memory. Huh, so the things that I think are true now and I see them perfectly clearly could have been completely constructed by me. Okay, now that I understand that, I'm gonna be a little bit more humble when I think about the powers of my own brain and the ways that my own brain can fail me. So that's really what the concept of neuropsychological humility is, and I think it's a really important, almost fundamental trait that we have to have as skeptics. Otherwise, we would believe everything that we see in here. And you will hear me harping on this word all the time, because I think this is an area where, as the skeptic community, and I mean, again, I don't have the nuance coming in from the US and, and speaking to you guys here in New Zealand, I don't really understand the nuance within the New Zealand skeptical community. Um, I think there are a lot of parallels, there are a lot of big differences, but I've, I've spoken a lot in the UK, in Canada, um, in, in South Africa, I've traveled the world to a lot of kind of like English colonial societies, and I think that there is sometimes, especially in the skeptic community and in the atheist community, uh, a bit of a struggle with this concept. A bit of a, oh, well we know what's best. And um, you just don't know it because you're not trying hard enough. And so I think that this is sort of one of those things that it's just an important reminder. And it's not something that I think comes deeply naturally for everybody, and that's okay. I think that empathy is a skill, and it's a skill that we have to develop, and it's a skill that we actually have to work on, just like skepticism. We have to constantly catch ourselves. We have to constantly catch our, or check our privilege and think about how to be more empathic in our, in our interactions. Okay, so I throw these in here. I did these the last um, time I gave my talk, and I do this because I think that they're a good template for, um, for now, what I'm calling the science communication and skepticism and psychotherapy top five. And right after I do this, I wanna tie everything up in a bow and pose some questions to you guys before we open up the Q&A. So when I originally gave um, a talk about a different topic, I think it was about the American landscape of television, um, because woo, yeah, science television in America is rough. Um, I, I didn't talk about the science communication top five, but the more that I dive into this stuff, the more I realize it really does apply, I think, both in seeing patients, but also in working as skeptical activists to try and communicate a message. So they are, number one, know your audience, or your patient, or your dinner table companions, or whoever you're talking to. You need to know where they're coming from, who they are. You also need to operationally define your goal. Right? Like, are we just having a conversation? Am I trying to persuade? What is the actual outcome that I want from this interaction? So not only do you need to know who you're talking to, but you need to understand some of the context around that. Number two, never underestimate the intelligence of your audience, but always underestimate their vocabulary. I think this is super important for science communication. It's also important when working with patients. It's also important when working as skeptical activists. There are certain terms, certain themes that become commonplace within a culture. And outside of that culture, they may not be understood. And sometimes when you utilize them, you're actually putting up a barrier between yourself and a, a culture that you're trying to connect with. I think so. that doesn't mean that you should dumb down your conversation because I think this is a big problem that television executives have in the US specifically, is that they water down the science so much that it's almost not science anymore because they think that the people watching TV are too dumb to understand it. But there's a big difference between just changing the type of language that you use or defining those terms to try and elevate the conversation in a clear way using clear language that's not intentionally obfuscating, you know, you don't want to seem pedantic, because um, it actually does uh, drive a wedge between you. But I think that, you know, the concepts are, are understandable. 
Obviously, this is a very important one. I think this gets to the core of what a lot of us talk about in skeptical activism, that it's not about what you think, it's about how you think. I think sometimes we want to just say, no, this is the right way. But this is, I, I, it's a takeaway that I got really early on when I started seeing patients. And I would have somebody sitting in front of me, and they would say, for example, oh, I'm with this person, and they're really abusive, and, and I'm, I want to get a restraining order, and I'm really struggling. I think I'm gonna see him tonight. I'm gonna go see him tonight. And you're like, oh my God. And I realized, you can't give somebody insight. You just can't. You can't just gift them the gift of insight. They have to get there off their own. You're never going to be able to bully them into insight. And so this is why relearning how to think is so important in um, skeptical activism. This one um, is, I think, more about if you're somebody who is interested in taking on this role, maybe more publicly, but I think even in your um, close-knit interpersonal interactions. Uh, but this is, this is kind of when I give talks about science communication, people are, who are interested in starting a blog or starting a YouTube channel, starting a podcast, something like that. One of the things that I, I like to tell people is that the thing about you that you might be in some ways kind of maybe ashamed of, or you might think is too quirky, maybe you have like a funny way that you say certain words, or a list, or there's a part of the way that you look that you feel like isn't quite like everybody else. And you've been looking at, you know, a, a Brian Cox, or a, um, a Neil deGrasse Tyson, or, or somebody as sort of the way you should be. The reason those people are successful at what they do is because they've leaned into who they are. You can't ever be them. And so I think sometimes when we try to emulate what we think of as a perfect example of something, not only are we never going to shine, but we're going to fall really short because the things about us that make us connectable are sometimes the, the very things that we don't want to lean into. And so it's a very hard thing to do, to lean into the things that maybe when we look in the mirror we don't like as much about ourselves, but sometimes when you lean into those things, people are going to connect with you more because they're going to go, oh, you're quirky, you're unique, you bring something new to the table. And so um, it, it is really important. I think authenticity is the name of the game. It's the name of the game in therapy. You will not be a successful therapist if you're not authentic with your patients. They will see right through you. It's the name of the game, I think, in, in public communication as well. They'll see right through it if they feel like you're acting or you're not being yourself. And then this one kind of encapsulates everything, right? You want to meet people where they are. Sometimes they're not quite ready. Sometimes they're, you know, in what we call like the pre-contemplation stage, like in therapy, for example. If somebody comes to therapy, but they're not ready to start to try to make changes, then you can't start to do the things that somebody who wants to make changes are going to do. You have to find out where they are in their process. And so this is kind of the conversation with people, like, how do you talk to a flat earther? It's like, well, does that flat earther want to hear what you have to say? Because that's a very different conversation than somebody who's just trying to figure it out. So I think the, the meet people where they are is super important. I have a great, actually, example of that. Somebody told me that um, they were tasked with giving talks about climate change in evangelical churches in the States. Hmm, okay, um, it's a weird job, but I'm gonna do it. And um, they realized very early on that they would put their charts and their graphs up and people were like immediately disengaging and being like, whatever, you're a shill, I don't believe anything you say, because these were young earth creationists. And so what they did was they would put a graph up with global temperatures and they would do the little, the tiny little break, you know, that you do on the axis, and then they just started 6,000 years. And then they just show everything from there on. And what it did is it got them to at least not close their eyes from the beginning. And so it's like, the, it's not a concession, but it's a way to say, okay, I'm gonna start with where you are and we're gonna move beyond that. These very subtle ways to meet people where they are can be really effective. Genius. Um, and my bonus, stop trying to sound so goddamn smart. It doesn't make you look cool, it just makes people not like you. Like really, don't be a pedantic dick, it's not fun. Um, yeah, I don't respect you more because you use a lot of big words. Uh, okay, so this all, I think, coalesces. I hope, in my mind, this talk makes sense, so you guys can um, give me your honest feedback, because I would love that. But this all coalesces in my mind. Uh, what time did I start, by the way? Oh, sweet, okay. Um, into this main question, which is, how do we make sense of the world? As skeptics, as people who are maybe steeped in pseudoscience, 
um, as the people that we want to reach, as the people that join us at the dinner table every night, um, at, as the patients that we're trying to help, you know, treat their suffering. How do we make sense of the world? So the, the philosophical term for that is, is our epistemology. It's how do we know what we know? What is truth? How do we arrive at truth? And there are lots of different types of epistemologies. And I think everybody in this room is probably sitting in this room right now because they feel with a, a very, very strong passion, a fervent passion that the scientific method is the best epistemology we have. And I agree with you. I'm telling you that right now, I agree with you. That's why I am a scientific skeptic. It's why I've worked as a scientist for so long. The problem is that we can break down some of these epistemologies into different terms. And we're getting deep into the philosophical like jargon here, so, so bear with me for a second. Have you guys heard the term logical positivism? Yeah, okay, a couple of you have. Have you guys heard the term constructivism? So we're getting back to, to the title of the talk. Is constructivism a four-letter word? Ooh, is that a bad word? Or like postmodernism, ooh, is that a bad word? Um, as I've been studying existential psychology and philosophy more and more and more, I've become really interested in this constructivist epistemology. So for those of you who don't know what it is, it's the idea that we construct reality. Now, I think it's very easy as skeptics to minimize this worldview because what we do is we think that all constructivist epistemologies are fundamentalist and extreme. We hear constructivist and we think solipsist. We think, oh, a constructivist is somebody who thinks there's no such thing as reality, that everything we experience has been made up in our minds, that we're never ever going to reach consensus, and that science doesn't matter. That's the way that we often minimize that term. The problem is, you can do the same thing with logical positivism, but we don't ever stop to ask ourselves if we're doing that. So logical positivism is the epistemology that if you can't interact with something scientifically, if you can't develop evidence, right, you can't interrogate nature in such a way that you achieve some form of scientific evidence, if it's not measurable, if it's not um, subject to something like a randomized controlled trial, then it's kind of meaningless. It's not that it doesn't exist. It's simply that it's harder to make inferences about the world when it comes to those kinds of things. So let me task you with a psychology example of that. Something that's actually very easy to investigate in psychology would be constructs like, not easy, it's all pretty complicated, but let me come up with something sort of easy. Maybe not willpower, that one's pretty tough. Um, consciousness. It's a big question, but whether or not somebody is conscious, we can kind of test for that, right? We can sort of do these different coma scales, we can look at different parts of the brain that we know are involved in this, and we can identify whether or not somebody is existing in different levels of consciousness. Okay, so that's a construct. We've constructed this idea of consciousness that has very good biological markers for it. What about love? Do you guys think love is real? <laughs> Because a lot of logical positivists on the extreme side would say, no, I can't measure it. I don't know what it is. What? How do you measure the effect of love? How do you measure a rainbow? How do you measure a rainbow? You take a, uh, a, what do you call it? A spectrum, yeah. You've got numbers, you've got nanometers you can put on that. How do you measure the effect of love, right? These are the more kind of the more we get into psychological constructs, like willpower, like love, like um, especially you know existential psychological constructs like meaning, fear, um, even trauma, for example, the more that these kinds of outcome measures become complicated. And again, there's, there's ethical considerations when we're doing these kinds of studies. Um, but how we measure these constructs have to be operationally defined. And so, Basically, the crux of, of this talk, and what I really want to come down to, is that 
I truly am starting to believe more and more, and I'm becoming more invested and interested in the idea that logical positivism and constructivism are not mutually exclusive. There's a reasonable view to be taken in both camps. And the reasonable view in the logical positivist camp is, uh, is this philosophical stance in which only statements that are verifiable using the scientific method are things that we can say fundamentally are scientifically verifiable. That's what we know and that's what we can say. Constructivism, the world does exist independent of our mental constructions but our knowledge of it is always going to be constructed by human beings. We're never going to understand the world not through our own filter because it's a fundamental truth of being human that we have to perceive things. It's a, we're wetware, it's the way our brains work. And I think that's a really important thing to always remember as skeptics. It's to not poo-poo that view, but to fold it in to our view, to not be fundamentalist, logical positivists. The same way that a lot of kind of anti-skeptical people we see as fundamental constructivists, that their truth is the only truth that matters, and how can they not just see what everybody else sees. I think understanding this perspective makes us better at having that perspective, and folding those two things in together is a really meaningful and valuable, um, valuable takeaway. And I'll tell you that I came <coughs> to this place through seeing patients. People come to me and they're suffering and they want to get better, but they're stuck. And I can't just tell them what to think. And I can't just shake them into seeing it this way. They have to go through those processes themselves and maybe they'll never fully get to that place, but they'll iterate closer and closer and closer. And it's really all that any of us can ask for. So, on that note, I would love, I really hope that you guys, maybe some of that was food for thought for some of you, and I would love to engage a little bit and potentially answer some questions or at least just have a conversation um, coming out of that. So thank you, by the way. <laughs>
I think it's tough. So this may be um, an uncomfortable, so we don't you know, often talk about this on the SGU, but this is my talk, so I'll tell you what I think. Um, I do believe, and maybe this is actually less controversial in this crowd because your conservatives are probably still more liberal than like some of our liberals. So keep that in mind, our goalpost has moved really, really far to the conservative side in our country. And I fundamentally, as a liberal thinker, have a moral problem with a lot of conservative views. That is why right. I don't pre prescribe to those views. And so the issue becomes when there's a moral disconnect, there's a game that can be played. And I think sometimes the liberals play by certain rules that the conservatives are willing to break. And it's very difficult when you say, but I don't want to steep, stoop to that level because that level has already been stooped to. So what do you do? That's, I think, a philosophical conundrum. Do I play dirty, or do I continue to play clean in the hopes that we're going to keep elevating the conversation? Yeah, but do you use your empathy to understand the conservative side? Absolutely, and I think that that's one place that we really did fail yeah. um, in Trump's election. Yeah. Uh, I think that there was a, there's a lot of nationalist, white nationalist sentiment that's growing throughout the world right now, and I think that we've instead of just blanket saying, well, these people are racist, I think that we haven't really taken the time to stop and think, okay, what is automation doing to our society? What happens when people are losing blue collar jobs? What happens when people who might have already had racist colonial sentiments are steeped in those because they no longer can hold on to a position of power or authority that they thought that they had? And so starting to really understand the complex psychology moral or not, I think is actually really, really important for having those messages uh, go across. I also think one of the biggest problems with American society is that liberals are really bad at marketing. <laughs> like, we really are. If we had just said Medicare for all, like, back in the, the Obamacare days, I think things would be really different, but we didn't. And then, and then the conservatives said death tax, and then it was all over. So I think that we do have some of those struggles as well in our country, for sure. Uh, hi. Um, I have a question about us when we use the term skepticism to describe what we do. Um, do you think that when we use that term, we get ourselves in a little bit of trouble, and in fact we should be using uh, scientism, because a skeptic does not hold beliefs or knowledge, and we have beliefs in this room. I'm sure this has been you know, talked about in conferences before, but are we shooting ourselves in the foot by talking about skepticism when skepticism in a Hellenistic context is actually quite a high bar uh, for knowledge. And do people even really understand yeah. what that constraint is? I think that you know language evolves, and I think that that's something that's really important to remember. There's some people who are very um, keen on maintaining perfect definitions, and there's some people who are really comfortable with the fact that that word now means something different. Um, some people like to reinvent. Some people want to stick to what it always was so that we can be true to it. And I think this is something that we struggled with in atheism as well, right? Atheism evokes an idea that I'm rejecting God. My view as an atheist is that I'm actually, I believe everybody's agnostic. That's why I don't use that term. I think it's redundant. I think you're either a theistic agnostic or an atheistic agnostic. Nobody really knows. Some people live their life as if they know one way, some people live their life as if another. So I identify as an atheist by saying, I simply do not believe in God. It's not that I believe there is no God. I make that distinction, some people don't feel the need to. Some people make the distinction in the other way. And I think that might be a good metaphor for that. It depends, you know? My uh, other podcast is called Talk Nerdy, because I'm like, being nerdy is cool, and I really want to like reinvent that word, or I want to like ride that wave of nerdy becoming a cooler thing again in, in popular culture. And so I, it's a hard one, right? Because anytime you start to herd cats, especially cats who by definition are like, I don't have a tribe, um, then it becomes really difficult because you have a lot of infighting there. So for me, yeah, we all meet in these rooms, and if the whole thing is like, we are the skeptical cavalry and we're going to change people's minds, maybe it's not that effective. But if you're like, I'm a skeptic as an individual, it doesn't really matter what you call yourself if you're living those values and you're trying to show, you know, it's like when people ask about, I keep going back to atheism because I think it's a, a good model, but when people have debates about whether God this or God that and blah, 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 is the goal to actually convince people to not believe in God? Like, I don't care. I'm not trying to convince people to not believe in God. What I'm trying to show people is that I'm like a good moral citizen, that being an atheist doesn't mean that I'm a Satan worshiper, and that they can sort of accept atheism in society and culture more, where in our culture, in American society, you, you're dead if you want to run for government, isn't it? You're not going to get elected. Like, it's a very, very negative 
uh, mark that you wear. And so just trying to change the perceptive perception of it is what's important to me, so I like to use the term. But I think different people approach it differently, and there, I don't think there is a right answer to that question. So it's something we all have to think about personally. Do I talk too fast? <laughs> like, is it easy to understand my accent? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Hi, Cara. I'm, Hi. I'm a high school teacher, and uh, in Christchurch, we've been um, looking at some studies that's recently come out of Canterbury University. Uh, Dame Sue Bagshaw was involved with delivering this. And she talks about this concept of ACEs and first childhood events. And you mentioned briefly about trauma um, and dealing with young people all the time in my job. That I'm staring down the barrel of hearing adults talk about the future world with climate change. And, and here in Christchurch, we've had, had events like March um, happen to our kids, the earthquakes prior to that. So they've had a lot of adverse childhood events. What place do you see logical positivism having in helping to shape young people's future views of humanity? That's a really tough one, and I think that's one of the things where, I mean, I don't want to paint it with a broad brush and say it's not helpful, because of course, it, it, I think that there's obviously a very important role for both of these things, but I think sometimes when we lean so heavily on a very evidence-based view of the world, um, especially what ends up happening is that we maximize the importance of the things for which we are able by by the way that they are designed to be able to gather evidence and we minimize the importance of the things that aren't subject to randomized control trials, meta-analyses, things like that. Things that maybe qualitatively we can gain information about, but it's not gonna be held to as high a bar. Um, and I think when we do that, unfortunately, we end up making a moral decision societally about what's important. And so I think it's interesting that you bring up these early, uh, adverse childhood events these aces. Um, I, I, one of the parallels that I see between kind of the culture where I grew up and um, and what you mentioned in Christchurch between the earthquake and and between the uh, you know some of the horrific like violence that is that in the U.S. gun violence is so common that it gets to the point where it doesn't seem to affect people anymore. Where there will be a school shooting every day and you'll be like, oh God, I didn't even hear about that one. It like and I think it's the normalization that can actually be more negatively impactful at a society level than something being really traumatic. Because as long as it's traumatic from an existential perspective, it's going to be a source of meaning making. We're going to be able to utilize that, um, that horrible thing and think about it in a way. It might be a boundary experience. It might make, help me, um, it might help me uh, appreciate what I have more. But the minute that the, I mean, this is what happens in genocide. This is what happens in, when, uh, in despotism, is that um, horrible things become normalized. And they become so normalized that individuals don't even notice how horrible it's become. And I think that this is a fear with our own president right now, and the way that he talks about migrant um, populations. And I think it's a real fear with the gun violence problem in our country. So I know that didn't quite answer your question about logical positivism. I think that there probably is a way to utilize that perspective, but unless you're willing to fold in, I think some of the more empathic and just human, these fundamental humanist kind of views, uh, operating from as if like science can answer every problem and science can actually answer all the problems of morality, I think is actually a very dangerous proposition. And it's one that in some ways has led the skeptical community, I think, to become really insulated and to become closed off from kind of society. As, uh, as a whole. Hi. Uh, Hi. I really loved your point about having empathy for the people we challenge, but I was wondering if you thought it could run the risk of coming on as condescending if you think someone's beliefs are kind of stupid, but you're trying to go, let's sit down and analyze the evidence, even if it's like, you know, a drunk farmers or something that were wrong and now they believe in aliens. Yeah, I think that there is kind of this, first we have to di differentiate too, I think sometimes we don't do a good job of doing this, between somebody who is experiencing like symptoms of mental illness and somebody who is conspiratorial, 
you know, but they're uh, cognitively capable. So I think sometimes what we end up doing is making fun of people who have like psychosis, which is actually really dangerous. So, so let's put that aside. Let's say we're talking to somebody who's rational and healthy, um, but it holds on to these sacred cow beliefs. I still subscribe to like a very Christopher Hitchens view that there's certain ideas that shouldn't be beyond reproach. But you have to understand with the individual how much their ideas are central to their construction of their own identity. And so if somebody feels like the self is their ideas, then threatening those ideas can actually be really dangerous for them. But if somebody has a pretty healthy relationship with their ideas and they can sort of step away from them and say, I am who I am and I think this right now, but I've changed my mind before. I mean, these are the qualities of skepticism that we want to imbue, right? But the problem is sometimes we forget that the ideas and the self can be so inextricably linked that we approach them, like, as a society, I think it's very important that we should be able to make fun of ridiculous views, right? We should be able to make fun of extreme Republican views that are dangerous. We should be able to make fun of the flat earth idea, but I wouldn't make fun of a person to them about their core identity. I think that that can actually be really traumatizing. And so keeping those things a little bit separate, I do think is important. And you're right, we can say condescending, but that's why I think that that's not really empathy at that point. If you're condescending to somebody like, mm, you're feigning empathy, but you're not actually being empathetic. And I think that's where the genuine piece comes in. Yeah, it's just hard to actually get empathy. It is. <laughs> Empathy's not, it, that's the thing. We talk about it as if we're all born with it and we just like, you know, are suppressing it all the time. No, it's like, you have to work on it. It's a skill. Okay. All right, um, last question. Last question. Nobody asked about it. It's not psychology. I can't believe it. Um, all right. Good one. Cool. <laughs> um, as a, an existential psychologist, how do you know that you're doing a good job? Because it seemed from what you said earlier, there may be a tension between that sort of discounting the personal narrative, particularly in scientific studies, mm -hmm. and how that might relate to the sort of placebo effect. So, yeah, how do you know that you're doing a good job as a, as a psychologist, and what are the outcomes that are yeah. important to you that distinguishes that as a practice from uh, a non bona fide therapy? So I view the placebo effect a little bit differently than like a physician would, and that's because I view a placebo as a, in a randomized control trial, a placebo is an actual physical thing that somebody takes that ha does not have the therapeutic effect in it. So that is a placebo. Now what we have, I think, bastardized as calling the placebo effect is actually nonspecific effects. So maybe they're common factors, maybe they're therapeutic effects. We just can't put our finger on what they are, but something is happening there, and that person is feeling better or getting better. Um, that is like if somebody takes the medication and they start to show a little bit of improvement, you're going to see that that's probably because they're going to the doctor. It's not because of the medicine, but they're having a healing touch. They're experiencing interpersonal um, important. These are important things for health um, and for mental health. The one place we don't see a placebo effect is in mortality. A placebo will not help you live longer. Like we know this, but you might be happier while you live longer. So I think it comes down again to this conversation about what is your goal. Therapy is not about extending life, it's about having a fulfilling life. And it's about in some ways easing suffering, or in my view as an existentialist, it's about finding meaning in suffering. So the, the main crux of existential psychotherapy is that people come to therapy for very specific reasons that underlie all the other nonsense. Fear of death, lack of meaning, um, loneliness, and then the other big core one is the struggle between responsibility and um, freedom. We think that these things kind of underlie a lot of the reasons that people suffer in the world. And for us, it's about being in the here and now, having a very intense interpersonal relationship to try and develop a scaffolding for your life so that you can live a meaningful life. Um, and so, yeah, those things aren't, they don't lend themselves to collecting evidence. And that's why I do think that self-report evidence, of, does somebody feel better? When it comes to their psychology, isn't that what matters? That they feel better. <laughs> That they, they're doing whatever it is that they can do to lead a life that they feel is fulfilling. And, and at the end of their lives, and I'm really interested in end-of-life care, palliative and, uh, and hospice care, at the end of their lives, they can say that I found 
deep meaning, that there was profundity in my experience on Earth. That's what I care about, and so that, I think, lends itself to the type of therapy that I do. But again, I think one of the important things we have to remember is you've got to operationally define something, and you have to set up the problem. It's the only way you're ever going to solve it. There are no broad answers. There's no one-size-fits-all, and it's all in the nuance, which sucks, because it's really hard to talk about, but it's, it's gray. It's not black and white. I think that's a great place to leave it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> uh,